Okay, welcome back once again, all you CISSP wannabes. These are the IT Dojo CISSP questions of the day. I am Colin Weaver, and each and every day I'm going to ask you not one, but two questions for you to ponder and contemplate. Let's get right to it. All right, question number one coming at you. A lot of words. Uh, you may need to click pause in order to read this one, but let me paraphrase. Uh, DDL, the data definition language, is a set of commands that are used to allow you to go in and create, uh, modify, and delete different objects within a database. Uh, the DDL is also used to create the definition of all the objects and attributes within that database and what their relationships are to one another. Now, which of these is the term used to describe that definition of all the objects and attributes and how they're related to one another within the database? Go ahead and click on pause, figure out what the answer is. When you're ready, click play, we'll break it down. All right, now in the context of SQL, structured query language, uh, SQL is broken down into a variety of different types of, of statements. There's, there's data definition language, which is what we're talking about in part here. There's a data manipulation language. There's a data control language. There's a data transaction language. There's a data query language. So there's all these different languages that are used. Uh, each of them really just kind of distill down into different command types that we would go in and use to manipulate the database in some way, whether we're trying to control the structure of the database, add stuff to it, take stuff away, we're trying to commit transactions or roll them back, or if we're trying to manipulate the data that's stored within the database. Um, all of these different languages are, are designed to go in and do that. Now, the first answer choice here, uh, data control language, uh, it's not the right answer that we're looking for in this question. Data control language is really more associated with like commits and rollback and, 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 uh, and you know, save kind of uh, statements that you might find in, in your SQL uh, syntax and structure. So that's not the right answer. Uh, the next choice, schema, is absolutely the right answer that we're looking for here. Uh, schema is, in, in effect, the definition of all the objects and attributes within your database and is defined using your DDL, your data definition language. Even though we got the right answer, let's keep going and talk about why the other answers are not the answers that they're supposed to be. Uh, normalization, normalization is the process of going in and optimizing all of the different uh, uh, tables and columns in your database to make sure they're as efficient as they can possibly be so that you don't have redundant data and things like that. It's a, an interesting topic that's for a different day. Uh, polyinstantiation, now, as, as polyinstantiation as it relates to databases is the idea that you have a table that has a column which serves as the primary key but more than one row in that particular table has the same value in that primary key field. Now, normally we'd say that you, you can't or shouldn't do that because it, it breaks your uniqueness rules. However, in this circumstance, you're going to have some sort of a, a sensitivity label associated with each individual uh, row in, in the form you'll have a column that defines a sensitivity label and the row uh, will uh, be different, that value be different in that sensitivity label field. Now what this gives you the ability to do is then to have two different um, rows that have the same primary key, yet they have different sensitivity labels. And then when a user is trying to view information in one of these rows, uh, they're going to be returned information based upon what their, their assigned sensitivity label is. Uh, the next item on the list that is not one of the, not the correct answer is cardinality. Now, as it relates to relational databases and uh, to data modeling, Cardinality goes in and describes what the relationship is between the data that's in one table and uh, data that's in other tables. Now, for instance, you could have a one-to-one -one relationship, a one-to-many relationship, a many-to-many -many relationship uh, between the data in, say, table A and the data in the other tables or in another table that you have within your uh, database. But cardinality goes in and defines that. Uh, the other thing that ter uh, cardinality has sort of a duality of, of, of usage in terms of its terminology, uh, cardinality also goes in and talks about the uh, with any particular table, um, as it relates to SQL, how many uh, rows uh, for a particular column have the same value? Uh, for example, if you had a table that had a column that was labeled gender, okay, and it was, say, a user's table, there's going to be a lot of users that have one particular gender. So if you go in and say, you know, well, if there's, if there's 500 entries in the table and you know, roughly half of them are all going to have, say, a gender of female, then we would say that that has low cardinality. Uh, low cardinality means that a lot of the individual rows for that particular column are going to have the same value. 
High cardinality means just the opposite. If something has high cardinality in a given a particular table, it means that there's a tremendous amount of uniqueness for the values in that particular column. An example of this might be something like, uh, say, an email field or a user ID field or an employee number field. Um, we expect uh, with, with a high cardinality for there to be tremendous uniqueness um, up to the point of every single one of them being unique or maybe close to all of them being unique. And then the last one to distract you on the list down there uh, that's, that's worthy of mentioning here is AJAX. Uh, AJAX stands for Asynchronous JavaScript and XML. Um, it's actually a, a, a whole bunch of different technologies. They're really kind of focused on creating your web app, but doing a lot of the processing on the client side and then have back-end communication going on with the server to exchange data as necessary. Um, uh, it's it's primarily using JavaScript on the client side and then XML for the data exchange. Now, that's changed over, over the course of the years. Uh, these days, we actually see AJAX using something called JSON, which stands for JavaScript Object Notation. Um, and uh, really, that's just a more human-readable file type than, a, than an XML file is. It's not that XML is, is not human-readable, but uh, JSON is much more human-readable. But uh, that's all for a different topic and a different day, and it's just there to distract you in this particular question. Okay, here comes question number two. Question number two says, again, I'm paraphrasing, read the words there. Uh, in addition to IP addresses, DHCP servers give out other useful things to nodes on the network, like a default gateway, the location of a DNS server, if you're kicking it old school, a NetBIOS node type, the list goes on and on and on. Okay, now DHCP can be a big target in your network, so given this big long list of uh, possibilities, which of the following are not, underline it, not attacks that can occur against your DHCP server? Uh, it's a lot of words. Click pause, figure out what the answer is. There's three of them okay, that are not. And then when you're ready, click play and we'll break it down. Okay, first option says that you can have a rogue DHCP server on your network and it can give out IP addresses, creating a man in the middle or denial of service situation. That's absolutely something that's a, a legitimate concern for your DHCP server deployment. So we're looking for things that are not concerns. That is a concern, so that's not one of the answers. Second option says that an attacker can gain control of your DHCP server and go in and manipulate the settings to uh, give out different stuff to, to your users. That's absolutely a concern as well. So again, we're looking for things that are not a concern. So um, that's not the right answer either. All right, third option says using TCP redirects, an attacker can send your DHCP packets to a remote network, uh, say to a remote DHCP server. Uh, no. Uh, DHCP packets are uh, UDP based and frequently they're broadcast based so none of this stuff is going to get redirected onto a remote network and uh, since it's not TCP based anyway you really can't go in and do that so that is absolutely one of the correct answers here because that's not a, a, a legitimate attack or legitimate threat to your DHCP server. Next batter up on the list says that um, a rogue DHCP server can be used to reconfigure your SMTP settings for your internal mail system uh, that's just some made up junk. No, that is not a legitimate concern that we have for uh, DHCP. There's nothing about DHCP that would allow something like that to happen. Next item says that an attacker can request uh, IP address after IP address after IP address, typically by spoofing a MAC address or something like that, and exhaust the list of available IP addresses for the DHCP server to give out. That's absolutely a concern that we would have in a uh, DHCP based environment so that's something that we're going to have to keep an eye out for so because that is a concern that's not one of the correct answers here remember we're looking for things that are not uh, a problem and then the last option on the list says that an attacker can remotely send negative acknowledgments when a user on a LAN segment tries to renew their IP address uh, this is a negative the only way that you could spoof a negative acknowledgement would be to be on link Okay, now that means you have to be in control of a computer that's on the link in order for you to be able to go in and send one of these negative acknowledgements. I can't sit on a remote network and spoof negative acknowledgements to uh, you renewing your IP address with your DHCP server on your local network. So that is not something that is a legitimate concern. So that is the third and correct answer that we're looking for here. All right, there you have it. Two questions. Our first one was on DDL, the data definition language, and uh, what a schema is. And then the second question was on whether or not you have legitimate or illegitimate concerns as far as your DHCP deployments. I hope that these questions were helpful for you in getting you um, better prepared for your CISSP exam. Um, if they were and you liked them, please click on the like button. And if you want to get the questions every single day, please click on subscribe. And that's it for today. I'm going to see you tomorrow.